Welcome to Hill Talk Tuesdays with Lisa, where transformation begins as we evoke, embrace, and evolve. Greetings, 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 and welcome to Heal Talk Tuesdays. This is Lisa. Today, I am so excited for having Mr. Don Green with us, and this has been coming. It's been coming because um, it's an honor having Mr. Don Green. And for those of you who are not familiar and have not heard uh, about Mr. Don Green, allow me to share this. Uh, Mr. Don Green is the executive director of the Napoleon Hill Foundation and has held this position since 2000. Hello, Don. How are you? I'm fine, Lisa. How are you? I am wonderful. Thank you so much. I know time is precious, so allow me to do a just a little bit of an introduction before we go into the interview. Mr. Green has been the president of the Vice County Chamber of Commerce and also the president of the foundation board of the University of Virginia's College at Vice, as well as their board of trustees. Mr. Green organized and has been successful in getting a three hour course, credit course, Keys to Success, included in the uh, University of Virginia Vice curriculum based on the success principles of the Napoleon Hill. He is also the executive director of the Napoleon Hill Foundation, where his leadership and many scholarships that have been endowed as well as fully funded the Napoleon Hill uh, professionship in the business department. So thanks to Mr. Green, the Napoleon Hill team, and the popularity of the Napoleon Hill's writings continues to have a positive effect on audiences, especially those who want to think and grow rich over the world. So, Don, again, thank you for your time. And the principles we are talking about reading the book, it's uh, 13 of them. Which one do you believe of all the 13 principles is the one that really sets a spark in every business person to be the success? Well, without a doubt, it's a definite purpose knowing what you want, what you want to do. That's the starting point of all achievement. Most people don't have a clue what they want to do. Oh, they want they want money or whatever. But it's more just it's more than just wanting. You have to have a definite purpose. I want to be a medical doctor, and then do whatever what it is, and then you have to study and do those things that will take you there. If you want to go to Florida and you was living in Virginia, you know you you know a little. You got to go south, but you got to plan. You know, at least I would ask you a question. Why do people plan their vacation for one year or the next? They'll go, they'll get back and they've been to the beach and they say, I don't think we ought to go to the beach next year. I think we ought to go to the mountain. Well, we had a wonderful time at the beach. Why don't we get us a condo at the beach? They discuss it from one year to the next, but they don't plan their lives. Why is that? They plan their vacation, but not many people plan their lives. They're what we call wandering derelicts or like tumbleweeds, every which way the wind blows. And then they start making excuses why they're not successful. Anyway, you've heard them all. Rich people don't pay enough taxes. No, the problem is 60% of people don't pay federal tax. Too few people are truly successful. You, you know, you, you got money in your, in your website, the word, so I know you know what money is. And there's only four uses of money. You can read every book, and I, I don't mean to boast. I've read thousands of books. My one of my little books is a uh, is for popular it's millionaire mindset. That's where it all begins. At it all begins. It says think and grow rich. Yeah, that's where it starts at. But the word in think and grow rich action is in there seventy seven times. 
you don't just think about doing something. You don't think about baking a cake. You get the ingredients and you mix them together and you put them in the oven. It may not turn out the first time, but you don't quit. Things that come up uh, confront you. Right. You, it's a challenge. You keep repeating it till you get it till it becomes it becomes a habit with you. And anyway, we, we make our habits and our habits make us good or bad. But no doubt, deafness of purpose, knowing what we want is the starting point. I mean, how can you obtain something? You don't even what you want. I mean, you just have to accept life as it is. And, but then you start making, you start making excuses uh, because of, of uh, uh, your failure, basically, in life. And so you start blaming others. Perks didn't send me to right school. Get over it. They probably done the best they could. Uh, the teachers didn't like me. Uh, taxes are too high. There's no opportunities. You can make excuses all you want. But the same effect would be you go out on your front porch and sit in a rocking chair. You could rock all day long. It may feel good, but it won't take you where you want to go. You've got to make some plans and you've got to take, and if it is a word at all, it's action. It's doing something about it. Yeah. And it might not turn out right the first time, but that don't mean you quit. Uh, most people never even get started. And, and some of his lectures, he would ask the audience, how many times does the average person quit before they give up? And uh, they would hire one, two, three different numbers. He said, no, I said the average. The average is less than one because most people don't even get started. Oh, they would like this or that. And, and then, and or they'll start with a little effort and then say, well, it didn't work. My spouse told me it wouldn't work. I should have known better. And this is too difficult or uh, it's, it takes too much work or whatever, start making excuses. Rather than saying, this is what I am going to do. A little sign I got on my in my car and on my desk and I print up and I give away thousands of them. It simply says, if it is to be, it is up to me. And if, and if, and if we're having if we're having trouble, it's simply the fact is we look in the mirror and right there it is. As long as we're blaming someone, we'll never solve the problem. There's always something other to blame. But that but right. that doesn't take anywhere. There's always something other to blame. But definitely starting points, definitely of purpose, knowing what you want. If you don't know what you want, how are you going to get it? How would you know you when you got it if you don't know what you want? So what would you say is the number one key to success? Or when we think grow too rich, but what is the number one key? Is it having the desire? Is it a lot of people have faith, but and you say, what is your passion? What is your desire? Most people don't even know that. I know you say you have to know what it is. They want to be rich. They want to be successful, but they are not very clear as to what that is. Well, they, they have to figure that out for themselves. I can't, you can't tell your kids, well, I want you to go to vet school or med school. They've got to solve that problem. And if they don't, they'll never get there. Because if for, for, for instance, are for saying something like, saying something like uh, that, uh, I want you to go to med school or whatever, it's got to be what that person wants. Otherwise, they won't develop a passion for it. Because when it doesn't turn out well, well, that's not what I want to do anyway. So they got an excuse. But if they choose the path they want to take and they don't make it, all they got to do is look in the mirror. They didn't take the necessary steps, get adequate help, make plans. He says the starting point is a, the main thing is get started. Most people never get started. You'll have obstacles that come up in front of you. And uh, when you said faith, I think that's important. It's not just faith either. It's applied faith. Faith alone, you say you believe something. How strong do you believe it? You know, I know you've heard that here to tell of the, the people that walked to Niagara Falls that walked the, walked the cable and when he, he wrote, walked it blindfolded and he said are there anybody out there believe that I can put a person in a swill bar and walk them across here Niagara Falls blindfolded and a little boy out there jumps up and all I do I do I do he says Sonny come on up here and I'll put you in a wheel bar and I'll roll you across he said they can't even catch that little boy he's still running he said he believed it but he didn't he, he didn't believe it to the extent that he would try it and uh, that's the important part. It's not faith. 
Exactly. It's a fight made. It's a, it, you believe it so much that you're going to take action on it. Not just a, not just a thing that says yeah. says you would, you would you would like to do it. But that's extremely important. Um, Hill, Hill gave a speech and he talked about the essentials. And of course, one of them was a uh, deafness of purpose, and one of them was applied faith, and one of them is really, really important is going the extra mile. I could tell you story after story after story of uh, of uh, the principle of going the extra mile. And I always say, go the extra mile and then some. A man interviewed me, and I will tell you what he's worth or his name because he's a private person. 1975, Lisa. I was making about eighty dollars a week working a finance company. He started a bank, and he was short of people. And he wanted to interview me, and I came over and I drove over on a Sunday and interviewed. And he said, and he read the same books. He was a son of a coal miner. He graduated from Virginia Tech, an engineer, and uh, was wealthy beyond means. And he said to more friends, he's a mentor. We have lunch together. We talk on the phone. He supports us financially, among other causes. And he said to me in 75 June, That's beautiful. 37 years ago, Don, if you do a little extra one day, probably won't matter. If you do it for a week, probably nobody knows it. But if you'll work harder than all the other people around you, I promise you, one day you'll be the success most of the world only dreams of. And I remember that conversation like it was five minutes ago because it had such a deep meaning to me. And it's still true today. Those principles, the principle of going extra mile, it goes back to the Bible time when Jesus was the recipient of complaints from the Jews that they were Jews were made beasts of burden to occur to Roman soldiers' packs, and they complained. And they, and then they, they thought they would get sympathy. And they were told, when a man asked you to go a mile, go twain, T-W-A-I-N, which means twice, in order to do more than is required. But most people only want to do enough to barely get by. I did a fundraiser with our old friend Zig Ziglar one time, and he said that uh, he was in a factory, and he asked the old boy, he said, how long have you been working here? He said, ever since they threatened to fire me. And that, that's so many people, they're scared to death that they're doing a little bit extra. See, they say, I'll do more when I'm paid more. See, they got it backwards. They got no reason to be paid, get an increase unless they're producing more. If they were paid to do a certain amount and they're meeting their obligations, what they were told to be paid, but unless they have developed a little bit of personal initiative, which is extremely important, it simply means seeing something that needs to be done and perform it without being told. And uh, it's extremely, it's extremely important is to have personal initiative. Don't wait to the ship to come in. I've used that. I use that example. I gave a talk one time at the uh, of a historical society back in the 90s. And I was telling the people, and this is a little town where Napoleon Hill was born. And a lot of them never heard tell of him and him being born a few miles from where we was talking, where we was talking. So in driving home, I was a bank president at the time, okay? I didn't need anything else. I don't know, we, we had, I had a cable TV, dry cleaner business, spring water, I built pizza places and uh, and uh, Dollar General stores and, and uh, on and on. And I didn't need something, but on the way back home, it's about a 15 minute drive. I thought about what I was doing and I wrote a letter to Mr. D uh, the Napoleon Hill Foundation in the suburb of Chicago and told them what I was doing to promote Napoleon Hill. And they wrote me a letter back, asked me to come to Chicago and have dinner with the board. And I did. And uh, Mr. Stone, W. Clement, I think he's a billionaire, he told me, he said, well, you know more about these books than I do. He said, you ought to be a board member, now, which I considered an honor. But this is an example, Lisa. Nobody contacted me. They threw 150 million people in the United States, and I got the best position there are one of them. 350 million people. We are telling three red lights. Nobody contacted me. But here's my question is, if your ship didn't come in, why didn't you swim out where the ship was? That's what I did. Nobody, nobody contacted me. I contacted them and I created my own opportunity. And I see that all the time. The only thing I like doing accomplish as much as I want. I simply don't have time. I have to pick and choose. Yeah, I can do the students. I can do this and I can do this. It's simply not enough time in the days to do everything. So you have to pick and choose. But I see opportunity everywhere. I see opportunity everywhere. And uh, it's not difficult if you're willing to do the things 
that's uh, necessary to do it and have persistence. You know, tremendously important to have persistence. Read Billy Ray Cyrus's book, uh, Hill Billy Hart. He's born across over in the mountains, and you know, he's the father of old Miley Cyrus. And you can find out how she got her name. That was a nickname was Smiley. They dropped the S and she went in show business. Molly's not her name either. But he stopped to help a doctor. Billy Ray had been thrown out of school for having dogs in his room and his old baseball scholarship. As he was driving one day and a wow. gentleman's car was broke down. He stopped to help him. And a, and a guy was a doctor, a Dr. Bailey. That's all he identifies. Him. He gave him his card and says, stop at my office. I got something for it. And when he stopped, he gave him a copy of Think and Grow Rich and said he read that. And if you read his book, he's got a chapter in there on persistence. Tell him about what that book meant for him. He said they, it was like a boy said, Billy Ray, start you a band. And he said he didn't even own a guitar. And he said they were getting $50, sometimes 100 playing in what we call beer joints, rough places. Mm. But he come out with that song, The Girls Like the Dates Back, Achy Breaky Heart. And of course, then we know about Little Molly, and he's no doubt made hundreds of millions of dollars. And he credits it to that story he read in uh, he read in Think of Rich on Persistence. And and the list is on and on and on and on. It's right. so, a cell a day goes by that I don't hear someone uh, like Steve Harvey's people says he's read the book 25 times. I've had other people, Truett Cathy is a personal friend, founded Chick-fil-A, was given a book in 37. His first restaurant was in suburb of Atlanta. It seated 10 people. He come up with a chicken sandwich. And he heard that thinking rich everywhere he went. I had four newspaper call me when he passed away because of his friends. He come up here and spoke to the college kids for nothing. And he was worth six and a half billion dollars. And he credited to the Bible and thinking grow rich, which he carved both of them with him everywhere he went. And uh, ju just it's just remarkable. And of course, I have I use a quote from Mark Twain. If you, people that don't read, they're no better off than people who can't read. And we've only got two ways of learning. My social media put it up on the wall since you heard me say it a thousand times. There's two ways to learn. One's from books and the other's be around smarter people. Don Green, I said, Lana, why'd you do that? Well, you said it a thousand times. I said, well, I kind of borrowed it from Will Rogers. It's something similar to that. But I said, you she teaches social media at the college. But I said, in your work, if you find some way we can learn, other than from books and other people. Would you let me know? I, I hate it. I've been missing out on a third way you can learn. So far, that's the only two I've discovered. One is by, one is by from people as smart as I am, and the other was through books. And I know we got to learn from other people. If a monkey can learn from a monkey, surely us humans can learn from each other. So that's the reason it's so important to associate with people that you can learn from. Another quote of Mark Twain's was, he said, don't walk away from negative people. Run from them because they will influence you. They'll influence you. So many young kids, young people especially, get in trouble associating with the wrong crowd, as my mother would say growing up. Birds of feathers flock together. Lay down with dogs, you'll get fleas on you. All those things were supposed to, were meant to be lessons that it's important. It's not that we're better than they are. It's just that we want to improve our lives. And that's what we do a lots and lots and lots of prison work hey, for years and years of mission. We have got, I got some letters on my desk today that I didn't get out on the nature from people in prison. They want books and what have you. But the thing that happens and the words recidivism, they're in prison, they serve a term, go back to the same community and they often end up in prison again because they go back to the same place. Uh, in one of the Hills books I published, Napoleon Hill's Golden Rules, he wrote in 1919, the first chapter, is our social and our physical environment. You know, we would color your hair and your eyes and so much your features come from your parents. Not tremendous what you can do about those. But the other is our social environment has an effect on us. We can change our location. You know, we, we can change our location. If we're, we can live in a better neighborhood. We can associate with better people. We can belong to the clubs that's got the right type of people in them. We can go to church and associate with people. Or, many, many other places that we can change our social environment. But those guys in prison, most of them go back to the same community and the recidivism rate or no words people say in prison. You think a guy leave, lose his freedom and everything would 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 run from that. But they're sent back to people they feel comfortable with. They feel comfortable with their like with their like people. 
and uh, uh, it's it's uh, it's amazing what the social and verbal happen happen to you because they first may not like it and then they get a little more accustomed to it and then they fit right in with it because that's what everybody they see around them, whether it be smoker or, or drink or drugs or whatever they follow what the, what the, because they want to what's it they want to fit in it may not be a good fit it may be what got them in trouble to start with and it's it's uh it's sad wow but uh You want me to shut up long enough for you to ask the question? Yeah, I mean, yes, you did. And beyond that, it's like you are such an incredible storyteller. We can, I can literally sit and listen to you for hours and hours. <laughs> Not only that, you are so gracious. Uh, I mean, genuine, what we call it, the kindness. And, and I've met you in person, and you would think that. Um, especially people at your stature, it's very difficult to reach or to talk to. And yet you are so personable and genuinely kind. Well, I guess it's my upbringing. I've been, I've been, I've been blessed. And the one road to happiness is helping other people. This, I, heard a, I heard an old lady in a newsreel, she said, that when she got to worrying, she went out in her garden and hoed her garden because she found out she couldn't worry and do and work at the same time. So if we're having bad troubles, all we got to do is find someone that's helpful. I mean, in mind, I'm going to tell you story after story. I'd like today I'm helping a guy. Uh, he's went through chemotherapy four times. I know he had tremendous loss of income, but he's a professional photographer. And I let his wife. Uh, frame pictures and so forth. And I give them assignments and stuff. And I, and, and I turn right around and give the things away because I want to pay. I want to put money and money to them, and to and to try to help them out. And uh, and I never saw it. I got a call one time said you could get on a Las Vegas walk or some other uh, the star or something for donations twenty thousand dollars or more. And I said, well, I'm really not interested because I've got every award you can imagine, but I never bought none of them. I think if people want to recognize you, that's fine. I'm not seeking publicity or, or bought uh, notices or whatever, because I've been citizen of Europe twice in this area, which the only person in history who ever got it twice. I never saw it. And I've got, I got, the, I've got so many awards that it will plaster a wall. But it's not that I necessarily set out and do it. It's just people recognize me. And uh, I hope I won't get killed for this, but this year or next month, I will be the benefactor of the year for the college, which is, I consider a great honor at the end of next month when they have a year and major. And they, they honor all the donors of the college. And uh, it's, it's, quite a, it's quite an honor. I never saw it. They, I didn't solicit it or nothing. I got this, I'm the only one I ever asked about I got the Sam Walton Award myself for uh, community service one year, and I actually called them where it come from. I said, how did this come about? I mean, I'm just curious, really. I mean, I'm a stockholder, and I love Walmart, and I, you know, 52% of the people never had a full-time job, and he works a million and a half people. I don't care what people says about Walmart, they provide tremendous service. And, uh, and they said, we had several nominations telling us what work you're doing in, in your community. But I didn't even know you applied for it. I didn't even know, I didn't even know the thing exists. But I remember some of the items. They got his got his uh, Walmart cap. They got a uh, plaque. Got a uh, uh, his book, autograph book of uh, by him of his his, of his uh, life story and so forth. And uh, it was it was a good feeling, especially the fact that I didn't know it was coming. I didn't know about it. But uh, it's nice. But it also keeps you humble. It keeps you humble. Uh, that people recognize what you're what you're doing because I didn't seek it. I just meant to do well and to uh, make a little di bit of difference and uh, or what whatever I could. And uh, and that's that's rewarding itself because what it does to you when you're helping others, you're at peace with yourself. You you try to help someone, not expecting nothing in return. People not that's not in a position to really find. 
and build old houses in Belize, and people are never going to know who I am or nothing. I'm never going to see them or whatever. I'm not expecting nothing back from them. And, uh, wow. and there's, but there's so many places, things that we can do just because it's the right thing to do and not expecting nothing back in return. Uh, and so oftentimes people doing something, though they're expecting a monetary reward. I don't even expect nothing. I send people a book out. I mean, if they read it, fine. If they post notice on it, that's fine. If they don't, that's fine too, because I did my part when I gave them the book. And that's and as far as it ends with me, I felt good that I give someone an opportunity to read a book that I think will help them. Now, if they take advantage of not reading it or disadvantage it, it it's beyond my control. All I can do is provide it to them when I see the occasion. I always carry some books in the car. If somebody says something about a book, I can always get them a book. But uh, I'm not expecting nothing in return because most of the people I probably never see. Again. That's beautiful. You know, um, the day that I got the book that you sent me and you gifted me this with this beautiful uh, writing in there and dedication, it's this is uh, beautiful. Uh, it's it's your book, and yet it comes from the principles of um, the Napoleon Hill. And when I was going through the 13 steps, the 13 uh, principles, when it came to the subconscious mind, the mindset and everything, it's like, this is everything that I do. The auto suggestions, the knowledge, the fate, the desire. It's like literally the work that I do with my clients is incorporating within the subconscious mind of what we believe, our core, our patterns, as you're saying, it's your beginning. This is how you grew up to be who you are. So if we were to sum it up, other than prayer, other than the 13 principles, and you being in the position that you have impacted the college, that they are learning this besides the regular college curriculums. What do you, what other rituals do you have that enhances not only your life, but how you have taught your daughter and your grandson and everyone else that you come to contact with? If you had one nugget to leave with, what would it be for our audience? Well, you mentioned all, you mentioned auto suggestion. I used a book, the name guy's name Shad Hemset, or he wrote a book. What do you say when you talk to yourself? It's the most important conversation, and that's what we need to learn. We need to talk to ourselves in a positive manner. Uh, I, someone, your girlfriend could come to, up to you and say, "Lisa, your dress is not proper," and and you could tell yourself, "Well, God, she ought to look at herself." But when Lisa looks in the mirror and says, "I'm not dressed proper for this." appointment I got. We tend to believe what we say to ourselves and our and our and our, our mind tends to produce what's in our subconscious mind, those things. What do people on poverty think about? They think about poverty and their mind produces what they're thinking about. So why can't we choose to think riches and let our mind steer us, you know, and to to riches? It's extremely important. Most important conversation you'll ever have in your life is the ones you have with yourself because we tend to blue ourselves, especially when we repeat, repeat them. How did we learn our ABCs? We repeated them. How do we learn How do we learn our multiplication? We repeated them till they become actually a part of us. If somebody says, Lisa, eight times eight, 64. You might not have said it since the sixth grade, but you said it so many times, it becomes a part of you. So why would you not put things up there that would that would produce riches? And I don't necessarily mean money, but I mean a good life, built to help other people, make a difference in their community. Uh, you know, there's a little poem, I can't remember it exactly, but it's written in by Monk several hundred years ago. And he said, I tried to change the world and I couldn't. I tried to change my country and I couldn't. I tried to change my family and I couldn't. But he said, I found out. If I change myself, I could change my family, and my family could change the community, and we could change the world. We can change the world starting starting with us. Starting with it all starts with us. No, we're not going to do everything, but we're going to do something. We'll 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 improve the world in some 
in some some manner. So when you're laying there in the wake or, or what you want to call it, do you want people to go by and say, wonder how much stock he owned? How many cows did that guy have? He must have had 10 or 15 cars. Hopefully somebody will go by and say, I wonder how many little kids he helped out. And, and that's, re that's, reward, that's reward enough because as I'm doing fundraising for the college, I got pretty close to me and I was kidding. I said, you know, when we get up in age, you got pretty good, you got a lot more money you need. You just start need to thinking about what you're going to make a difference with that money. And uh, he said, he said, what do you mean? I said, well, I don't think we're going to take it with us. But if you go before I do and you take all that money with you, would you get word back to me how you done it? He said, yeah, I got the list. And I know what you're talking about. I said, OK, we're friends. We're business partners, too. But uh, anyway, it, anyway, it is because we are put here to encourage one another. We're put here to give Acts 20, 35, and I'm not a preacher, but it simply says it's more blessed to give than receive. The girl that works in the val in Valerie, the girl works in development, must have been here for 30 years. I've worked with her. She uses on her on her email, she sends out a quote from Winston Churchill. We make a living by what we get. We make a life by what we give. And I think that, that sums up an that sums up an awful lot. But, you know, the more we give, the more we get in return. When the book tells us that we'll get it return, bushel overflowing, it doesn't necessarily mean money. Money is not everything, but it's blow oxygen. It's extremely important to carry out the work to St. Jude's, Shriners, Cripple Children, the church, missionary work, on and on and on, medical uh, 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 research and so forth. It is imp important. But there's other things important in life, too, because if all you've got is money, I'm sure you're not going to be a happy person. If you're scared to death, you know, the money, and you use that in your website, I notice, money in you, but but you can either have money or the money can have you. Mm. We, get to, we get to choose which one it is. Yeah, I got money and I'll use it to good me. Or no, the money's got me and everything I'm going to be dear to is making more money and cling on to it and not give a quarter to save an orphan. Uh, I don't think that's the point of it. It's the use of it, the money that's important. The same money that can buy some drugs is the same money can buy kids' school books. It's the same money. It's the means that we choose to use the money. And it's important that uh, we try to make use of the money in a way that we, as judgment says, that, uh, uh, that we can use it. And we got started to get into it. I'll shut off anytime you want me to. We got these four uses of money, and I've read and read and read and read, and I started to tell you, the first use of money is food, clothing, and shelter. President Eisenhower said, if all you get out of life is food, clothing, and shelter, that's what they get in prison. They all get food, clothing, and shelter. So life's a little more than food, clothing, and shelter. And the second reason for money is we have to have money when we're too old to work or they physically not able to, so we need some money put back. I call it for a rainy day. Right. And the, third, and the third reason for money is, I call it leading a good life. Those clothes you wear, those trips you take, that, that fancy Fuji, it takes money. That's the third use of it. And then the fourth, and you've taken care of food, clothing, and shelter. You've taken care of money. When you laid back, you get old, you've led a good life. And the fourth, and you still got money. And yours where you can make a difference of truly successful people. They could, they've got excess money that they can spend at their own choosing. If they want to help their church, they want to help St. Jude's, or they want to help their grandkids or, or whatever good cause. Most people don't get to number four because they skip number two. They, they didn't plan. As Victor Hugo said, they weren't planning to fail. They simply failed to plan. That's over a hundred year old quote. And it's, I think it says a lot. People weren't planning to fail. They just failed to plan. And it's important that we, we sit down and say, and say what well, this is what we're going to do and put it in writing well everyone i want you to know those are nuggets like gem those are golden truly i've been keeping this i know it's fake money but it's a million dollar money that was given as a token as a but I've been holding on to this and saying, you know, understanding that money has energy. 
And when we think about it as something that is abundance and prosperity, then has a whole different meaning of the energy that it gives and how we give it and pay it forward in life. Absolutely. So with that, I know you have a short time and I we are have come to our time of the session that I asked for this interview. You've been gracious for your time and your generosity. I thank you so much, Don. And this has become my new Bible, <laughs> except the Bible. And I look forward to meeting you again in person. And is there any way that we can gift one of your books to one of our audience if uh, the first person who says or does something, would you like to gift a book to somebody? Oh, yeah, sure. If I'm furnished their name and address, that's what works. And that book, there's an actual, actual copy of Napoleon Hill's personal book. In other words, it's 385 pages. And every, if you look on page 311 in that book that you got in 311 in, the old, in his book, it matches word for word. We didn't do no changes. We tried to design the cover as close as we could because the original cover had on the top for men and women who resent poverty. And that, because it was wrote about, people says it's not about money. He said he wrote it for the millions of men and women who are living in poverty and fear of poverty. And so it was about poverty in the middle of the depression. But they took that quote off the top, and then they put two and a half million copies sold, five million copies sold, 10 million copies sold. So we went back to the original cover and designed the cover and put that quote for men and women who resent poverty at the top of the top of the book as the original one was. But there are websites, naphill.org, N-A-P-H-I-L-L.org. I think all of our books and stuff is listed on there. We have two books, new ones coming out. One of them is completely mine. In February, it's up to pre order. It's called Napoleon Hill's Secret by Don Green. It's a hardback, 274 pages. It's with Humanix, the people that published Newsmax magazine. And uh, they, they really thrill. It's a hardcover. And it's been an awful lot of interest in it. It won't be out till February the 7th, but it's already up as a pre order and it's already an e book. And Beautiful. the foreign publishers have already been contacting us on the last week. So it, uh, I think it will do well. Thank you so much. And I look forward to the next time I'm in Virginia, I'm going to contact you and hopefully come and visit the foundation itself. Okay. You're very kind. I wish you the best. Thank you so much, Don. Uh, again, thank you for our viewers. Thank you so much. God bless you and may the universal light surround you all. I'm Lisa Bubari and this is the 3E event. Journey within and harness your inner power. September 30th, October 1st at the Western Rancho Mirage Resort and Spa. Get your tickets today at the3eevent.com. Thank you for being here. If you want to check out some of the testimonials that I've got, click right here. But if you want to go back and watch other videos from a week ago, two weeks ago, even a year ago, click right here. See you next time.